But we're going to follow him, right? He's not, Ray's not going alone. Right. Amen. Well, grab your Bibles while you're standing. The kids are already gone. Say this out loud. This is my Bible. I have what it says I can have. I do what it says I can do. I am what it says I am. Father, in the name of Jesus, I am about to receive the incorruptible, the indestructible, the ever-living, the ever-producing seed of the living God. Father, I confess my mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My body is awake. From this moment forward, I will never be the same. I'll never, never, never. I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, you can be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, uh, as parents, and we raise up our children, uh, I, I took it very seriously. I wanted to teach my children and prepare them so that someday they could be out on their own and uh, know that they could survive and do well. I also knew that when they got out on their own, they were going to make some mistakes and make some blunders out of things. And I remember I did the same thing. But we have to let them get out there and try it. And I see our Heavenly Father being like that. I remember when Pastor Jason was a little boy. Uh, he, I, I've always been interested in uh, construction work. And I was building a garage in our backyard and, and building some shelves. And he was probably about five years old at that time. And he watched me with the hammer and he watched me with the nails. And he watched me for a few moments and then he wanted to try it himself. Well, so I gave him the hammer and the nail and he worked at it and worked at it, tried to nail it together. And when he got to the point where he realized he couldn't get it done or it wasn't working for him, he, he asked for help. And I believe Jesus is like that. He's with, with the disciples. He gave them the authority. He gave them the ability. He told them to go out and uh, cast out devils. Amen. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper. And they went out and tried it, and they came back to Jesus, and they said, we couldn't cast him out. Well, did Jesus say, well, you stupid people, I gave you everything you needed. You can't get it done. What's the matter with you? No, he just demonstrated it again, and he showed them again how to do it. And today, Pastor Jason is very good at construction. He does really well at it. But the first time he bent the nail, I didn't say, well, you don't have this, kid. You're too stupid. How many parents are, would be like that? Now, there are some mean, cruel parents that are like that. But you know what? They're, they're, they're destroying the life of their children. But Jesus is not like that. And it doesn't matter how many times you try something. Guys, he never says you're too stupid, you're never going to get this. He'll pick you up and he'll minister to you. He'll tell you again and again and again how to get it done. There's one thing that you always have to remember, though. Jesus knows more than you. He knows how the kingdom of God operates. And if you'll listen to him, you'll get it done. If you just That's why he says, don't just be a hearer. Don't just be a hearer and shout and say, amen, 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 and then go out and do it your own way anyway. That doesn't work. You're going to have to get to the point where you trust and rely upon him and do it his way. Amen. And I believe that, that he has given us the instructions, and yet what we have been studying on Wednesday nights is something that you have to teach more than many other things because we have been trained uh, and equipped and, and taught to just let our mouth do whatever it wants to do. And that's not what Jesus says. If you want things to change in your life, you're going to have to do what Jesus says. Amen? So I want you to turn, if you would, tonight to our golden text, which is in Mark eleven twenty three, 23. And I want you to see something here. Hallelujah. And I want to take this from a different angle. Last week, I think it was maybe last week or two weeks ago, we, I did a little study and, and shared some of those things with you about the effects of words that this one scientist demonstrated uh, by speaking words to water. Uh, Julie wasn't here, and I was going to show you on the YouTube the pictures of what he showed 
in his, uh, in his uh, experiments and how when he spoke, to, he took water from the same resource, put it in different environments, put some of that water in an environment where, where words were going off that I, I love you and, and I, I want to be kind to you and you're nice, and he was playing nice music to it, gave it a good, nice environment. The other water he had in an environment where it spoke hate, murder, death, kill, hard rock and roll music with ugly words in it. Now, I'm not saying all rock and roll music uh, has ugly words in it, but these were words of death and, and demonic activity. And the difference is when he put this water under the microscope, the water that was exposed to the nice, gentle, kind, soft environment was crystallized and almost looked like snowflakes under the microscope. It was very beautiful. Uh, the water that was in this negative, bad, hated environment almost looked like mud when you looked at it through the microscope. It was astounding the effect that words had on the water. And we made reference to this. Your body is made up of about two-thirds water. And so your inner self is responding to your self-talk, your self-words, the things you say about yourself. You should never say, I'm stupid or I'm slow or I'm the slowest guy in the turnip truck or whatever. I, I just don't get it. You know, I'm, I'm the last one to catch. You should never talk to yourself like that. Why? Because your body is responding to that. Well, if anybody in the church is going to get sick, it's going to be me. No, you should never talk about that. Actually, the Bible, you read your Bible, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, my people should never say they're sick. Never. Read your Bible. It's in there. Did you find Mark eleven twenty three? 23? We're going to take this a little step further tonight. I want you to, again, turn your religious thinking off and just follow what Jesus said. Now, Jesus... Thousands of years before these scientists started experimenting with these things. Now scientists have done experiments and they realize that there's a gland in the back of your brain that when you speak it sends a signal and it goes through your whole body and your whole nervous system starts to respond to the words that you're speaking. And your whole body uh, is responding because Jesus told us that thousands of years ago. And they could have saved a lot of money and a lot of taxpayers' money if they would have just read the Bible. But you know how scientific things are? Sci people that are intellectuals, they like to prove this stuff out. And that's okay. I'm not against science. Science just backs up what Jesus has been trying to tell us for years. Watch this. For verily, now this is in red. If you have a red letter edition, so let's just say that Jesus is standing right here tonight and he's saying this to each and every one of us. So he said, verily I say unto you. So you can put your name in there. Verily I say unto you, Craig, that if you say to the mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and don't doubt in your heart, but believe the things that you are saying will come to pass, you will have what you're saying. Now I paraphrase that. It uh, didn't read that way when you were looking at it, but you got it, right? I don't believe I blasphemed the word of God by reading it that way. The scripture says, For verily I say unto you, that whosoever should say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe the things that he saith will come to pass. You shall have whatever things you saith. I want you to notice that he only said to believe one time, and he concentrated on what you should say three times as much. Because what you say, you will inevitably end up believing. You'll believe you more than you believe anybody else. I can stand up here and share this with you all, sir, every service. I could be like the Baptist. The Baptist preached salvation every service. I could get up here every service and talk about your words. And eventually you'll get it. <laughs> you got it already, right? You see, Jesus knew this. He knows how the kingdom operates. And he's trying to get that to us. In Luke 17, 6, the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say. Your faith will say something. 
What you believe, you say. What you believe, you say. Now, you see, I, I didn't know that uh, growing up, I was very intellectual. I didn't do good in school. I didn't like school. I didn't study, didn't listen. So, obviously, I didn't get great, good grades. I didn't put forth an effort. I, for the life of me, I couldn't figure out. You know, I'm a practical guy. I, I want you to teach me things that I'm going to use. I really didn't plan on going into politics, so I don't need political science. I didn't really care what people on the other side of the planet were doing, so I didn't study geography, didn't care about it. Didn't really care about history, because I don't care what ancestors did, I'm living now. So I didn't do good in history, I didn't do good in social science. I didn't do, but I did good in math. I figured someday I need numbers. I need to know math. I loved math. I'm good at it. I'm still good at it. But the rest of that stuff, I, you know, I did okay in English, but I never could break up a sentence and put all the stuff around the sentences, you know. I, I can speak good enough American English that you can understand me, even though it's Yankee talk. You can still understand it. So, I mean, I, you know, I did okay with that. I, I, didn't, I, I wasn't one that did poetry. I didn't, so all of those things, but I found out later in life. So I, I thought, well, man, I get D's and C's and everything. So I must not be very intelligent. That's the way I thought. But then I got married and I decided, hey, I'm going into business and I need to learn sales. And I went to this Dale Carnegie sales training class and out of all of the people that he had taught up to that time, all around the United States, I graduated the top of everybody that he had ever taught. I was interested in it. I wanted to know it. I studied it. I listened and I paid attention. Amen. So I found out I was pretty intelligent. If you give me something I'm interested in, I can do it. If I'm interested in it. But if I'm not interested in it, forget it. And so some of you, if you're not interested in the Bible, you'll sit here tonight and you'll walk out, no change. But if you're interested in changing your life, if you're interested in overcoming, if you're interested in making something of yourself, then you'll sit there and you'll, say, you'll grasp this. Well, Pastor, I've read that scripture a lot of times. You haven't read it as much as I have. You haven't heard it as much as I have. I sat for two years, three times a week, and heard Brother Hagin preach from that scripture for two years. And I still have the messages and still listen to them. Why? Because I want to get everything that Jesus wants me to get out of it. And I want it so deep inside of me that when, I want it to be first nature to me. That when, when, when I get a negative report, I don't want to say what that report is, I want to say what the word says. Amen. I want to train myself. Anybody with me? So if you had a, a, a faith like a grain of mustard seed. Now let's don't concentrate on the mustard seeds. Let's don't talk about amounts. I'm not talking measure. But Jesus was giving an illustration based upon the smallest thing that the human eye could see during his day. Trying to give them an illustration that your faith will talk. What you believe you'll say. Amen? Amen. His analogy today might read something like this. If you had faith as an atom, that's a small thing that can be seen under a microscope. Uh, in science, I didn't study science that well, but I remember an atom and I remember the, the electrons orbiting around it, kind of like the planets orbit the sun. I remember seeing that demonstration. Amen. So they, science has even gone further than that and they have found a, a subatomic particles and that they're studying. So Jesus might say something like this. If you had faith as a quirk, you might say, a quirk is a subatomic particle that you cannot see. You cannot see it with the naked eye. And Jesus was saying this, the smallest thing that you, can, you cannot see easily will change if you speak to it. You see, everything that around us is made up of atoms. Everything. The chairs, your clothes, everything. Are you listening to me? Mm. So scientists have done a study, 
And what Jesus was telling us is that this mustard seed or this atom or this quirk will change things around you if you learn how to operate with it and use it. Subatomic particles. Amen. The scientific world has done these studies and they confirm what Jesus has said thousands of years ago. Everything that we see, everything that we have is made up of these subatomic particles. You can't see them with your natural eye. But they're vibrating. Everything is moving. Everything is moving. Your table, your chairs, everything. Your body, it's, it's all moving. You can't tell it, but it's moving. Those atoms and those electrons and those quirks are moving. You can't tell it, but they are. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. I want to look at the B part. Jesus told us this. He said, things which are seen... How many of you can see the chair next to you or see? How many of you can see this podium? So this podium that you see is not made of things which do appear. So this podium is made of subatomic particles. You can't see them, but it makes this, it makes, uh, this podium visible to you. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Let me give you an example. Uh, Troy said I got a bottle of water here. Okay, this, this bottle has water in it. I haven't opened it, so it's full. It's full of water. And the chemistry uh, uh, um, it's H2O, the chemical terminology. The formula for water is H2O. That's what I was looking for. It has two atoms of hydrogen which you can't see, and it has one atom of oxygen that you cannot see. You cannot see the oxygen, and you cannot see the hydrogen. But when they are put together, they make up water. So there are subatomic particles that you cannot see. They're out there, but until they come together, they don't have a substance. Now follow me. Watch this. Before they came together, you couldn't see them with the natural eye. And actually, you, you can look through this, but you can still see the water. You can see it. All right? Turn to Hebrews 11a, 3a. Let's look at the A part. Now watch this. Hebrews 11.3, the A part. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So before God spoke, before he said, light be, the substance for light was there. It existed. But he, you couldn't see it until he said, light be. And when he said, light be, or he said, actually, the... the, the King James Version says, let there be light, but the original text says, light be. And when he said, light be, light became. It responded to his words. Amen? So we understand that through the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the words, the vibration, the sound of his words caused the substance of the light to manifest. His words caused it to manifest. His words caused it to manifest. So I say unto you, whosoever would say to the mountain, be removed, say it, be removed, cast into the sea and don't doubt it, but believe that your words create, the vibration of your words are creating all the time. Every word that you speak is creating. That's why Jesus says, you'll be accountable for every idle word that you speak. Every word that you say is creating substance. It may take a while, but if you keep speaking it, it will manifest. Words are energy. Understand that. And energy affects matter. Energy affects everything around us. 
Let me give you an example. We have a microwave in the kitchen. Most of us have microwaves at home. You can't see those microwaves, but yet if I put this bottle of water in there, take the lid off of it, and, take the, and I put this water in there, and I turn the microwave on, those microwaves vibrate this water, and these molecules vibrate together, and energy is formed, and it heats up. And if I let it go long enough, it will even boil over. Amen. We know at sea level, water boils at, what, 220 degrees? 212? 212 degrees at sea level. But if you go to Colorado, you got, it has a different boiling point because you're a different place at sea level. You're a mile and a half above sea level in Craig, Colorado. I think it's a mile and a half above sea level. So it boils at a different temperature. But at sea level, it boils at 212 degrees. Hey, man, I forgot my chemistry, right? See, I didn't study it in school very much. The energy of your words, get this tonight, the energy of your words, Jesus told us this in Luke chapter 17 and in Mark chapter 11, he said that our words are affecting everything around us. Everything. Because why? Your words are energy and they're affecting those atoms and those neutrons and electrons and, and the quarks. It's very interesting. Oh, my car is a piece of junk. My car is a piece of junk. This piece of junk always lets me down. This piece of junk is so undependable. Those atoms that make up that car, those quarks that are making up that car, are listening and they're responding to that energy. Have you ever been around people that, well, Pastor Jason and I, we took this principle that we learned at Rama, and we took that into construction with us. When we go into a person's home and we're bidding a room addition or bidding a, you know, a, a plan to build a house or, or remodel their house or whatever, I didn't like quoting a price until I sat down and I began to talk to the people. And I began to listen to them. If they had problems with every contractor that's ever worked on their house, you're going to have a problem. They expect problems. They expect things to go wrong. They expect delays. You listen to what they're saying. And then we would decide. Many times we'd walk away and say, we don't want to work for these people. They're not going to pay at the end of it. They're never going to be happy. You cannot satisfy them. There's no contractor that's ever worked for them that's ever satisfied them and their problem. We're not working for them. We've done that on different occasions. But when we go in and we know somebody, you know, they're, they're kind of, well, they ask you questions. They're legitimate questions. If they're, the, well, you know, I, I'm sure if you tear my roof off, it's going to rain. Man, you better pray over that. I'm serious. That's their property. That's their house. We learned. There were times when we would walk out, we would sign a contract, and we would walk out and stand on their front porch and say, we'll never have a problem as long as we're working on this property. These people are going to be satisfied. And we would take authority over those things. Because we learned that their environment, the words that they were speaking, their lifestyle depicted what they were saying in their life. We learned that. We knew that. We found that out. Amen. People that have accidents all the time they're an accident looking for a place to happen oh my goodness guys you don't want to be too close to them <laughs> Amen. oh my kids are rebellious probably end up in jail my kids are stupid they're slow they always get in trouble in school they're always fighting with neighbors they're always down in detention. You see, they're becoming, their, their makeup, the, their, 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 their atomic makeup is responding to the words that are spoken to them. Now, as you get to be an adult, if Sonny doesn't believe he's stupid, if he thinks I'm a smart, intelligent man, my words cannot affect him. I could say, you're a stupid man. And he'd be thinking, you don't know me, I'm pretty intelligent. If he, as long as he's thinking good about my words don't have power over him as much as his own self-talk does. My words cannot curse you if you don't let them. Do you understand that? So if somebody tries to say something about you, just, I don't receive that. I know who I am. 
you see. Now, you, you, if you get a hold of this, you'll understand uh, why people, and you can look back at history. I'll never forget my grandfather growing up. He used to set me on his lap all the time. But uh, Grandpa's scared to die. I'm scared to die. I want to die in my sleep. I want to die in my sleep so I don't have to. I'm, I'm so scared. One day my dad called me. They worked together. My dad called me and said, son, I went to pick Grandpa up for work today, and he was dead in the bed. You see, he, he prophesied his end. Are you listening to me? Elvis Presley prophesied his end. Died at the same age as his mother. He said he would. As soon as she died, he said he would. Well, how, well, yeah, but pastor, we heard he took drugs. It doesn't matter how it happened. He prophesied the end results and the, 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 the environment around him used whatever it took to get that to happen. Do you realize that over 700 years before Jesus was born, Micah prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem? And the, and the things that were spoken came to pass because it was prophesied. You prophesy your own end. Are you getting this? Um, you, should, you should be very selective of what you tell your children, what you tell your spouse, what you tell yourself. Amen? Well, my wife is a nag. She just nag, 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 nag. My husband is a jerk. Well, he's never going to change. She's never going to change. That's the way you see them. That's the way you believe them. Amen? Well, I always get sick. Every year I get sick. It doesn't matter if I get a flu shot or not. I still get sick. I expect to get sick. I always get sick. Everybody gets sick. No, I don't. Hello? Amen? I never have enough money. I'll always be in debt every day of my life. There's just never enough money. And it, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Man, take your wallet out and speak to that thing. Put some numbers in front of those zeros. I want to put, I'll have six zeros with a one in front of it. Or behind it, whichever way you want. I want it in front of it. I want the one first. I'll have, yeah, money come. I, you know, ever since I can remember, I always told Pastor Dorothy, I've got plenty of money. I got plenty of money. I got plenty of money. We moved to northern Michigan, and we had an old snowmobile that wasn't working. It worked okay when lower Michigan, where you only had two or three inches of snow. But when we got to upper Michigan, and there was two or three foot of snow... That old heavy snowmobile wouldn't run on that stuff. So we needed some new snowmobiles that would go on that fluffy two foot of snow. And so uh, we went and looked at some snowmobiles. We found two of them that we liked. And we were going to get the money from the bank. And uh, the guy wanted uh, some money. So I went home and I said, well, I guess I'll go home and find where all my money is. And I started digging in all of my pockets. I got my coats and my pants. And I, started, I ended up with the $600 deposit just by going through my clothes. Amen. Glory to God. I'll never be broke another day in my life. Glory to God. The vibrations of your words. Now listen to pastor. We, we're running out of time. The vibration of your words are affecting the atoms and the subatomic particles that make up the things that you are speaking about. And they are obeying you. Jesus said that. Now the scientists have proven it. Let me give you a little bit of scientific study. First of all, we've talked about atoms and the subatomic particles and the diagram and the atom and the electron orbiting around it. So, now listen to this. This is important. You can get on the internet and you can study this for yourself. Scientists have discovered that the electron is not always there in particle form. It's not always there. It exists like a cloud everywhere at once. Until, listen to this, until somebody looks at it. And when they look at it, it becomes a dot or a particle. Think about that. This is amazing, guys. So that raises a question. How does this subatomic particle, this electron, know that somebody's looking at it? 
How does it know that? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. They're responding to the observers and they're interacting with it. They see that you're interested and that you're observing it and so it wants to play with you. <laughs> All right, listen. I'm not going to take it any further. We're just about out of time. Luke, if you're watching, I'm going to start closing. So back to Luke 17, 6. Listen to this. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say. Oh, let me tell you this. Watch this. I'll, I'll probably go a little further with this next Wednesday. They also found this out. Okay. So they're looking at the atom. And, they, and this uh, electron and these quarks are not visible. They're in uh, the form everywhere at once until somebody looks at it. And I got on the, uh, on the computer and I did some study about the quarks, and it's really interesting. I don't want to get into all that, their experiments and how they did it. But they, they, they looked at this quark. Uh, different, one guy would look at it, and it would start acting in a certain way. And it responded to this scientist looking at it. He backed away, and a different scientist looked at it, and it responded in a totally different way. It responds based upon the observer that's looking at it. So that goes back to if I'm coming to work on your house, and you think that everything's going to go wrong, you're the one that's controlling that. But if I go over to Nancy's house and she has confidence that we're going to do a good job and everything's going to turn out, it's responding to what she believes. So around you, things are breaking down and my appliances don't last long and my clothes wear out and my car doesn't start half the time and I always get flat tires. Those things are happening because that's what you are believing and those quirks are responding to what you believe. So based upon, we can all look at this quirk and it's going to respond differently depending on how each one of us believe. That's why some people, that's why John G. Lake got a hold of this principle and, and the, he was a, a doctor during the buponic plague and he would not take the vaccine to protect him from it. He said, I don't need it. Germs can't live on me. They did an experiment and they took some saliva off of a person, a dead person put it under a microscope, and, and it showed all of the uh, uh, saliva had all of this uh, germs in it. They took some of that and put it on his hand and then took it and put it back under a microscope, and all of those germs died. Why? Because he believed in the healing power of God. He believed in the blood work of Jesus Christ. And you see, so that's why some people... Uh, have problems in their health. Guys, and I'll just be honest with you, I, I, I thought of this when I came in here. I don't, I don't know why I thought of this. It wasn't in my notes, but stress, concern, and worry send signals throughout your whole system, and your system breaks down, and you become a candidate for any type of germ that's going around. And you even create your own. That's right. When I, when I got drafted into the military, I didn't want to go to Vietnam. I didn't like the military. I don't like the chain of command. I didn't like a butter bar lieutenant telling me what to do. He was younger than me. I just, I didn't like the whole chain of command. I just didn't. I didn't. As far as I was concerned, you're wasting my time being in the military just like school was wasting my time. I want to get out there and make myself happy. No, you guys, some of you career people, you know, I'm, I, you're okay. I love the military for you. It's not for me. I'm thinking every paycheck when they gave me my $70, I'm thinking, man, I could earn 20 times this much if I was just turned loose. I didn't like it. And I had boils on the back of my neck. I went to the me, uh, uh, hospital all the time. They were running tests. They could not figure out why these boils would come all over my neck. Nobody could figure it out. I got discharged early, got an early out for occupational, uh, uh, seasonal occupation, got out April 5th, 
April the 6th, all those boils left, and I've never had them since. <laughs> Duh! Who was causing the boils? Me, because of my dislike uh, for the environment that I was in. You understand? See, guys, learn to be happy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. At famine and disaster, laugh. Amen. Okay, let's go quick. I'm going to go about four more minutes. You ready? If you had faith as a quirk, you would say. So you need to speak to those little quirks that you cannot see. We'll study that a little bit more. What you believe and what you speak influences your world around you. The things that you desire are made up of atoms, and these atoms and subatomic particles know what you believe, and they hear what you say, and they behave accordingly. And until you change what you're believing, and until you change what you're saying, your life is not going to change. The things around you aren't going to change. Oh, if any everybody gets laid off, it's going to be me. I'm going to be laid off. You know where the pink slips come. And you're, you're working in fear. No, God is my source. Amen. If, if, what if I do get laid off, Pastor, and I'm not believing that? Then get a better job. Amen. God is my source. Romans 3, 4 says this. Let God be true and every man be a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in your sayings that you might overcome. Amen. Glory to God, that you might overcome. You see, your words are judged, and they're held against you or for you. Amen. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, and I'm going to go fast, Jeremy, so I don't know if you're going to be able to keep up because i got to quit. It says, that they that observe... Lying vanities forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. What is he saying here? He's saying that if you observe what's going on around you, and you take observing those things, you're never going to change them. But keep your eyes on God's word and change what you're observing in the natural realm. You all mad at me? Say, I love pastor. If you say that long enough, you'll start believing it. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 states this. Jesus is the high priest over his words that are spoken out your mouth. Hebrews 1 3 tells us that our words uphold everything. Psalm 19 14 says, let my words be acceptable. Psalm 91 2 says, I will say of the Lord. Amen. Psalm 103, verse 5 says, My mouth will renew my youth. Well, after all, I'm 65 years old and everybody got to retire. My teeth are going to fall out. My hair's going to start falling out and I'm going to get crippled all up. Bless God, that's the way it all is. Well, your mouth's not renewing you, that's for sure. <laughs> Psalm 103, verse 20. Angels listen to the voice of the word. Proverbs 4, 24. Put away from you a disobedient mouth. Proverbs 6, 2. I'm snared or I'm taken by my words. Proverbs 12, 18. The tongue of the wise person is health. Proverbs 13, 2. I eat by the good of my mouth. Proverbs 15, 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Proverbs 18, 7. A fool's mouth will destroy him. It will destroy you. Malachi 3, 13. Wrong words will keep you from receiving your financial blessing. Even though you're tithing and even though you're giving, if you say, well, man, this isn't working for me, you know what? You're causing your blessings not to come. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 13. Speak what you believe. 
So if you're speaking wrong, you're believing wrong, and if you're believing wrong, you're having wrong, so you've got to change what you believe by looking at God's word. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says to speak what you believe. Did I already say that? Uh, 1 Peter 3.10, refrain your tongue from speaking evil and talk no guile. In Hebrews 4.14, these are just a few of the things. Hold fast the confession of your mouth. Keep speaking the same thing over and over and over again until it changes. Stand on your feet, everybody. Did you get anything out of this? You see how important it is? Go back to Mark eleven twenty three 23 and just do what Jesus said. Speak right words. Amen. Father, we thank you for the word of God that we believe in our heart and we speak with our mouth that we change things. We change our environment by the words that we speak. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. You guys are dismissed, and we will see you um, Sunday.